Good morning. Uh, welcome to the webinar this morning. This is a project update relating to advanced work packaging and more specifically information mapping to support that. Um, to make sure that you're able to hear this, could uh, one of you issue, send me a question? It's in the, it's, it should be on your screen. Uh, at the lower half of your screen, there's a, a window there for questions. So if some of you could, someone could type in a question to acknowledge that you're uh, hearing this, that'd be great. Oh, the volume's low. That's right. Okay, well, good. So, um, all right, so we'll move the microphone around, and hopefully you can see the title screen. And um, anyway, we'll start. So my name is Reg Hunter. I'm with Fiatech. I'm a senior uh, project director at Fiatech. Uh, many of you have been involved in advanced work packaging. We'll show you some information about the folks that have registered for this uh, webinar. Um, Many of you have been involved in some preliminary discussions that we've been having on this project that we launched. And so uh, welcome to the webinar today. And um, I hope you are able to uh, uh, see the path that we're going and roll your sleeves up and get involved with us. So with respect to some of the demographics, 83 people have signed up for this webinar. Uh, what's really uh, nice about it is that uh, of those 83 people, about 43 or so uh, indicated that they would be receptive to the idea that once you reached a certain point on this advanced uh, information mapping effort, that they would be able to perhaps support some validation testing. Um, 55 uh, folks within the 83 uh, have direct experience in work packaging, um, 51 have uh, ongoing work packaging activities going on and then about 50 uh, are members of FIOTEC. And what to me is nice about this breakdown is that uh, when you get close to the subject matter experts, you're able to essentially um, uh, achieve much better performance and advance the project in an organized way where it benefits the industry. So that's great. Uh, one of the things that we talked about during a, a workshop that we had after the post-conference uh, uh, meeting in San Antonio was that we recognize that work packaging is very important to both uh, to the to the industry as a whole but there's certain distinctions that take place between industrial and commercial and so there's actually sort of a parallel path that's going on with respect to is this an industrial work packaging effort or is this a commercial and so the breakdown on that is 67 uh, are industrial and 16 uh, are commercial of the 83. So hopefully on your screen, you'll see uh, uh, a pane, a window on the right-hand side. You can, reduce, you can reduce it to see the full screen by clicking on the right arrow key at the top left-hand corner, uh, or you can expand it. You also can uh, essentially send in questions, which you see pretty much close to the bottom where the four Xs are, and you can uh, issue a, a question and you can designate uh, who you want the question to go to and say, this is going to be an environment for us to track your interests in certain areas and associate uh, your interests specifically to you so we avoid confusion. Uh, preferably, rather than sending it to everybody, it would probably I, I'd recommend sending it to the organizer and our organizer and presenter, which is two pull-down options that you have on the two-part. Okay. Uh, on, so what this really represents is a, an opportunity to input your information uh, in runtime comments. So if something's confusing that Ted's talking about, or if you want some more clarification or something like that, you can go ahead and type it in. Uh, we're at the Shell facility here in Houston, and we can see your comments and we'll interrupt Ted with your question if we think that it, it's important for, for the clarity or we'll address that when we have more of the discussion later on in the, in the webinar. Um, it's also the environment that, again, that you, we use in order to designate to allow you to designate which areas you're more specifically interested in participating going forward. Uh, with respect to that, though, if you're interested in something and you have a slide uh, that caused your interest, then if you could indicate what slide number, which is in the upper right-hand corner, that you're, uh, that you're talking about, that would be helpful as well. Now, one of the uh, last things, and you need to jot this down because the number won't be available after this page, but if you look at the top of the page, you'll see a phone number. This is a Shell-provided phone number for you to call in. Near the halfway through the conference call, we're going to have a discussion, uh, an open uh, forum type discussion. And so the number that you can use to be able to participate that in that is the 713-222-0377. 
and you use the, the conference ID as you see there. Okay, so hopefully you're able to have a pencil there and jot that number down because you can call in now, you're welcome to, but right now all the lines are, are muted just to be able to let Ted get through the presentation. Uh, so hopefully that's clear. From a safety moment standpoint, one of the things that people know FIATEC for is advancing new systems and technologies. And from a safety standpoint, you have many companies employing different technologies uh, and having the workforce adopt using it and becoming familiar with it. And um, there's there's a strong potential from a, from a risk standpoint that someone will be walking around a construction site and so enamored with their iPad or whatever tool they're using, their tablet PC, that they'll stop being sensitive to the vehicles and activities that are surrounding them. And so uh, keep in mind that during your training and adoption and your pilot testing with respect to new technologies, that safety still needs to win the day. And no matter how interesting the technology is, the, the employee really needs to focus on safety. This is in the slides that were provided to you already. I'm not going to read through it, but uh, what's interesting and nice about FIATEC is they have uh, a, a framework to deal and a policy to deal with antitrust. And so what's nice about FIATEC is that multiple owners and EPCs all can get together and set aside their company's hats, put on FIATEC hat, hats and talk about how, what are the challenges our industry faces and what are the ways to essentially improve productivity in our industry as a whole. Uh, but just the takeaway here is that you can't talk about things like cost, you can't uh, discourage uh, particular suppliers and things like that. It's, it's really more driven on how do we make the industry better as a community. Uh, we had a meeting, uh, we had a conference in San Antonio, and in the conference we had a post-conference meeting that related to uh, this project, and the names kind of changed, but during the meeting we spent probably about two two to three, oh, actually more than that, probably four hours talking about, you know, what is information mapping and what is uh, work face planning and what is the challenges we face and how do we go about addressing it. And uh, it was a very, uh, it was a very active and productive conversation. It became real clear that we had to get our arms around it a little bit tighter and be much more systematic and structured in defining what this project's about. So um, we we're fortunate that we had Martin Swain agree to lead this effort. He's with Shell. Terry Earhart on Hatch to deal with the industrial side, and Jarrett Knox on uh, Kaiser Permanente for the co for the commercial and institutional. Um, as you'll see in the slides coming up, this isn't in a vacuum. We're actually interacting with CII and to some extent CO uh, Contractors Association of Alberta. Is that what they call construction construction owners association? Yeah, of Alberta. construction owners associations of Alberta. They've been very interested and very involved in trying to make sure that that projects are performed more effect, effectively and efficiently. And so Bill O'Brien, who's been working with CII, and he also works, he's a, a, PA, a professor at UT, been working with CII and COA, as well as Theotech, has been interacting with uh, everybody. And so he acts as our liaison. Ted Blackman with ConstructX is our technical lead, and, and I'm Reg Hunter, and I'm project support staff. On the right-hand side, you see the, the folks that participated in the meeting and indicated an interest in becoming actively involved in the project. Okay. So from a timeline standpoint, we had an initial kickoff webinar. It's available on the FIATEC site for anyone who wants to go. And, and Ted made this presentation to help you uh, people understand what the challenges are relating to uh, uh, workface planning and installation work packaging and all those kinds of things. Uh, we generated a project plan, which is almost totally outdated now <laughs> that we have to revise. And then we had the post-conference workshop that I already talked about. And so after the post-conference workshop, we, we went about replanning the, the AIM project so that it could deliver things in a more systematic way. And so where we are now is we're having a project team meeting, obviously webinar. And from that, we will revise the project plan and we'll form sub teams in order to drive out uh, uh, phase one information uh, in advance of our members meeting, which is gonna occur in October on the 7th in the Colorado, okay. So if you see any questions. Okay, so with respect to the agenda, what we're going to do is we're gonna provide you an update from when we had the workshop at the, uh, at the conference. We're also going to give you a breakdown structure that are logically organizing partitions objectives uh, and to enable better 
high performance sub teams to be formed. Uh, we'd like to reach consensus on expectations and deliverables and priorities and, and what, what we want to do and what really provides meaning benefits to, meaningful benefits to the industry as a whole. Um, we want to know, we'd like to know who would be the leads and participants in the different uh, sub teams uh, and who are the subject matter resources, which is why I pointed out the people that have signed up for this conference. It's, it's very promising because by and large, most of you have a vested interest to make sure that this is successful. Um, we're going to discuss the development approach for that defines incremental tasks and milestones necessary. So what we want to do is we want to get the sub team sort of straw manned out and then talk about how do we go about uh, approaching each sub team in order to make the deliverable. So this is a little bit of a, a mission impossible thing given that we only have two hours, but I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to shoot for in our agenda. Uh, and then we'll talk about milestones and uh, timelines. So again, we this isn't in a vacuum. We are essentially linked into other initiatives that are worrying and concerned about advanced work packaging and industry industry initiatives. And so it's a collaborative uh, approach. It's my last slide. So from a motivation standpoint, there's many documents and, 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 and uh, this was the one that struck me as the most interesting. Uh, installation work packaging is essentially the kitting and aggregation of information and materials uh, to hand over in, in a block of work to a, a crew to be able to go execute it during installation. And it needs to be as comprehensive and complete as possible. Uh, anytime the crew has idle time, you, you can say they aren't being efficient, but the problem could also be is that they don't have sufficient information and they're waiting on guidance from engineering or, or, or someone else or the material's not available or the information's ambiguous, okay? And so there was a study that was conducted by CII um, and where, they de where they determined that in a normal work day, if you looked at the direct work that the craft uh, in employee is providing, it's just a little bit over two hours, and then the rest of the time is spent dealing with the, uh, the, uh, the attributes that you see above that on the bar chart. And so from a benefit standpoint, clearly you have to be able to provide a complete uh, comprehensive documentation package and all the materials and organize all the equipment needed in order to do the installation before you can start trying to drive that time interval from a little bit over two hours to much more than that. So having said all that, um, uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to Ted now and uh, have Ted talk. Sure. Thanks, Reg. And I'm just going to jump back to the, the previous. Oops, left, right. I can jump back to the previous slide real quickly to emphasize that, you know, if, if we do this right, and again, it's a broader industry initiative, but if we're able to shift a significant portion of that waiting time and a significant portion of that travel time down into the direct work, look at that slide, you'd almost think you could double the productivity. It's a scary thought. It's an exciting thought from my perspective, but you know, there's significant waiting and travel time there that, that is highly inefficient. And you know, th this is one of the, the um, deliverables that have come out of, or one of the artifacts, I should say, that has come out of the joint COA CII effort. This diagram showing the concept of advanced work packaging and how work phase planning docks within it. So, work phase planning really hits directly the work itself, where the work phase you know, needs to do work and they need to have things in front of them. If you chunk it down to small enough bite-sized chunks into packages, you can benefit it. But, you know, the difference between work packaging and work face planning may be best thought of as well, work face planning makes sure that those work packages are executable before the field's doing them. So the field's not sitting there trying to rip apart work packages or, you know, figure out what to do. Instead, they're given a work package that has already gone through a constraint check to say this work can be executed and hence you shouldn't be waiting. You know, the worker should be getting to it. And actually, if you're doing it right, there should be a backup work package that's also 100% constraint-free and completely independent of the other one. So for whatever reason you may not have predicted, that one that you had as your primary work package wasn't executable. Every crew's got another one sitting right there to say, we'll go to work on this immediately. So there may be some shifting. And if you do that right, that's great. But again, coming back to the point of COA and, and CII, and Todd, did we lose the slides? No, 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 no. I'll keep talking while, while the next slide comes up. So coming back to the to advanced work packaging, one of the things that is, is COA, the Construction Owners, uh, Owners of Alberta Association, got involved with CII, it became, well, it's not just a problem in the field. And if you don't make the problem a project-wide problem and get engineering and procurement and the early project involved in the development and support not only of the installation work packages, but also the engineering work packages, and the which is the EWPs and the construction work packages, you often have uh, 
uh, I'd say, unpredictable success on whether or not installation work packaging goes well or not. And so looking at it at a broader framework and also introducing in the, the set of tools to, to make that happen. So you know, moving on to the next slide. Todd, can you advance it for me? Yeah, I'm trying to. Apologize for no, the technical challenges. No, so this is just a backup, and it, it, it kind of represents a lot of what we said. Some of the slides are going to be represented as backup, and it assumes we've gone through it. So you know, let, let's move on to the next one. And you know, this is another one of the artifacts that have come out. And you know, it's important to note as well that the joint committee, CII Co committee, will be presenting their results at two major industry events coming up. One is the CII annual conference near the end of July. They'll be presenting their results. And then there's another COA-sponsored conference up in Calgary in September that is specifically focused on workplace planning. So they'll actually get into greater levels of detail at the COA one. But if, you know, this diagram that's shown here is the summary version of a very detailed work process model that the committee has developed where they've broken it down into three major stages, stage one, two, and three, going from you know, in, in different segments of the industry may call it different things. So they've kind of made the terms a little generic where stage one is, you know, before you even get into the detailed engineering, you're in the concept and early front end loading stages of the project where, again, you should be committing to the work phase planning approach and getting the systems organized, getting the areas organized, getting your EWPs and CWPs defined before engineering ever begins. So it kind of flips the problem on its head, which, you know, the industry has done a pretty decent job of, but it says really get construction involved in that process early and make sure that your CWPs are clear and that engineering is going to be sensitive and driven by those construction work package sequences. And then as you get into the detailed, so much of what we're going to do in terms of this project is also identify various work process aspects related to the technical support of advanced work packaging and correlate it to these stages and phases as well. Another major artifact that's come out of the joint initiative is delineating the types of packages. And so, you know, whenever you talk about a work package and then get into the different categories of engineering to construction to installation, et cetera, you generally break them down along trade boundaries. And so there's a whole collection of work packages and COA CII have gone through and defined what should be in a work package. You know, what, what consists of a work package? And of course, it's a guide. It's not a, a mandate. Every company, every project needs to take that and come up with, well, what do they consider a work package? And from my personal practical experience, you know, I've seen that sometimes you, you only may be doing advanced work packaging in a, in a select number of trades. So depending upon the project, you may not try to do work packaging across them all. And there's generally the concept of a walk, crawl, run mentality where you know, COA and CIA have also defined that. They've defined a maturity matrix that says, well, where is your contractors, where is your project team, where is the, the owner in terms of adoption of advanced work packaging? Because again, you don't want to try to burn the ocean with this and jump in and think you're going to do it all at once. And so, you know, but, but clearly defining the work packages along trade boundaries makes sense. There's a whole other set of backup slides I'm not going to present here, but they're included in the deck for your reference, where, which is a set of work packaging recommendations produced by the committee. And it's important to note again, relative to our project, they don't get very into very they don't get into the technical details of it, which is I think one of the, the areas of collaboration that our group and our project can really add into it is, you know, where does the technology come into play? But they certainly did highlight in terms of not only benefits, but particularly barriers. That one of the challenges among a number number of challenges are that you know you don't there's not a single application that's going to support the entire work packaging process. And even if there was, the reality is that you're going to have multiple contractors that have independent systems that need to participate in it. So the idea that one single application, so the work, the, the advanced work packaging really drives the necessity to have improved communication between software tools and the information being put into them and the information coming out of them. And to date, it's, it's kind of an art. You know, I think that it's it's going to hopefully rapidly move towards a science, and that's what we're about. And so so we've emphasized on this slide where you know the the barrier was existing tools don't support protocols to enable information sharing. Well, I don't think it's just the sharing. 
I believe it's more a matter of can we do we actually have a good definition of what are the requirements? You know, what needs to be shared? And again, it may not be overly prescriptive, but even as a template example that then you know projects and companies can use and say, well, I need to modify this for what works for me. Um, there's really not a good reference model anywhere of what information needs to go where. And you know, even within organizations, I've often seen in the in some of the best successful companies using work-based planning, that knowledge may not make it from project to project, where one project has a good example, another project doesn't. Then furthermore, where particularly where some of that information needs to be supplied by a partner on the project, you can definitely see it start to break down. So even if a company develops a successful work-based planning model with another partner company, they move into another project environment and suddenly there's a different contractor involved. You know, it's, it may have been over the years honed to work within that ecosystem, but suddenly it moves into another environment and there's not a contractual deliverable that says, here's the information that's needed to be provided. It can quickly break down. And then you've put an investment into utilizing software tools to help the work packaging process. And often the tools get blamed when in reality there's lack of clarity. So I think that, that you know, getting our effort and, and our purpose is to be able to get some clarity to that. And so this kind of represents the convergence of information and systems that's needed to support the work packaging process. Bringing that information together such that the implementations of advanced work packaging can be robust and highly repeatable. So that through our project, we will identify what information is needed where, what are the type of applications that either consume or produce that information. And that's a challenge, you know, because again, it's, it's not that there's just one source of information. This slide, without going through every single individual bullet point, this slide shows the type of systems and applications that are typically utilized on a project that have some level of participation in the advanced work packaging process. You can see right here, it's you know, more than a dozen. I've got two hands up here in the room going, well, you know, I got probably eight to 10 on one side and eight to 10 on another. And as you count the number of systems that need to be involved, and maybe not all of them are on every project, but again, it represents kind of a, a kitchen soup of, of things that are happening on the upper right-hand corner and you know the challenge this is again a backup slide that then just further provides detail into the specific types of applications that support this and by the way this is a starting point for one of the major deliverables on our project we want to flesh this out further and actually you know, hopefully take it to not just be applications but you know our approach to it saying well how do we figure it out you know and, and if we take the approach of work packaging you know, our, which is kind of what we've we thought of post workshop is let's break it down into bite sized chunks, just like the work packaging process on projects breaks it down into work bite sized chunks. You know, can we break the problem down into bite sized chunks and not just look at the balls as an application because it gets a little overwhelming if you just think, well, this application needs all this stuff and it produces all this stuff. You're somewhat back into a difficult problem. Break it down to where this ball would represent a specific function and purpose of where somebody's using an application on a project. So it's more the functional subset of an application type that's being done to accomplish some task. So it should, again, coming back to the CII COA material, it should support some work process where some application's being used and that, that application requires information as an input and it's gonna produce information. And then through our project, we wanna look at, are there already standards that exist that can help us in this area? But I'm a firm believer that even if there's not some well-developed industry standard, it shouldn't stop us from documenting and saying, well, this is the information that's needed. And it may not require an industry standard to make it successful. In fact, I know from practical experience that it doesn't. But if we can get this documented and really understand the type of information with clear definition of attributes, columns, and examples of data, and then what's being produced, and then put that into a library, so instead of just a big reference of all the stuff needed, get it down into bite-sized chunks that can be utilized by projects to support <clears throat> the work phase planning and, and, and advanced work packaging process. I see there's a question that, that in terms of the CII COA conferences and, and the upcoming reports, and you know, we will follow up to provide uh, links to you know, those specific conferences. But continuing on this, this concept, you know, okay, so breaking it down into bite-sized chunks, you may think of this as our 
EWP slash CWP level. This is going to be our broader area. So in terms of our larger work packages, not the installation work packages, we've taken a first pass to say, hey, there's you know, maybe six major categories of where applications are being utilized. And there's going to be lots of lines between them. Right? And so I didn't clutter this slide up with between the lines. So I thought of this not only as, in a sense, the, the phases, but you know, it's it's of a project. You could almost see it. It follows you know the life cycle of a project per se. Was our approach to say, well, hey, let's categorize the information usages in terms of these different major categories going. And the more again we can line it up directly into the COA model of well, where is not just within stage one, but there's actually in terms of the COA CII model again detailed work process diagrams that show an activity happening. As we define our modular chunks, we should better relate it to those specific boxes that are outlined in the CII COA model in terms of here's a work process activity, here's where the application is supporting it, and have a correlation between the two so that we're not developing a model that's inconsistent with what the industry standard best practice for advanced work packaging is. And so for this presentation, we felt, well, hey, let's go through an example of one of these. And you know, I, we've also developed a list. And this is one of the major inputs from our group here assembled that we're hoping to get feedback on. And so you know, I'm not going to walk through each one of these in detail, but I do want to give it some level of coverage and not trivialize it. This is a, a major, um, major aspect of what we've done since the Fiatech conference. What we've done over the past two months was really go through and say, let's break it down into the bite-sized chunks where we could not try to tackle the whole problem, but start to tackle pieces of the problem. And I, just for simplicity, we may want to go back and change it, but I lumped engineering and fabrication together. It may not have been a good thing, and we could always debate whether or not we come back to that. So, but again, the, the point I was making is we're looking for input. You know, do you think that there's functional uses that are missing here? And some of that may come through the evolution of the project itself. So the engineering and fabrication I don't. It, I see it largely as a one-way flow, although we shouldn't really say that's true because the more, again, the CWPs are defined, but you know, at least what AIM 1.0 represents is until you have good engineering information, and a major thing that I learned personally over the past 15 years is you don't get all of that out of your prime engineering contractors. A lot of that information in terms of what's being built ends up coming from the fabricators. That's why I lumped those two together. I mean, you know, if the, the pipe spooling and the structural detailing is often not done by the prime contractor. And that structural detailing part pervades across industry sectors. Whether you go into the commercial, industrial sector, et cetera, you'll find that usually it's a still detailer that's determining the piece mark information, the structural piece marks that's needed to support installation work packaging. So until you get those fabricators on board with delivering that detailed engineering data, again, things can fall apart and you don't get success. So I did an initial breakdown of that into five major categories of information on the engineering basis. And much of the content of what goes into a work package is going to come from that. And as you go through the outline of packages, you know, your drawings, your component lists, et cetera, has to be driven from the engineering and fabrication data. And honestly, I think that can be further refined in terms of feedback flows back into engineering and fabrication, saying here's the sequencing, et cetera. So please don't consider this list by any means completely done. It was a great first pass at saying here's the chunks that we want to break it down into. Similarly, you know, looking at the supplier logistics and site materials, and that category definitively becomes perhaps one of the, the highest blamed constraints of why work can't be done in the field. And so, you know, focusing in on the relationship between material delivery and the installation work packages should be one of our high priority areas. Additionally, in to that, the alignment of schedule and cost information. Whenever I'm, I'm, I'm talking about schedule as well, let's emphasize that you know, there's different levels of schedule. You know, you get to your level one, level two, level three, where you're still interacting in a CPM scheduling tool. Getting that lined up with the engineering data is a non-trivial process. It's gotten far better. So just the areas of 4D where you can take a schedule, connect it in, and get the information grouped. And, and quite frankly, if, if, if the advanced work packaging model is adopted correctly, your CWPs would be in a schedule. 
many projects, that's not the case. Most projects today, you get into it and the schedule is organized different than your CWPs per se. Then you get into the detailed bill of material data and it's tough to sort out what goes into a schedule. And uh, you know, then you spend a lot of arm work trying to get those two lined up. And again, the tools to do that have gotten better over time. But being able to get not only the schedule and WBS definitions lined up with the CWPs and the deliverables, but also the cost coding information. There's significant efforts on that. But then again, you, as I mentioned, you get below the level three into the quantity tracking level, where you're in a level four, level five, level six, depending upon the, you know, your project, what level it is. But ultimately, you're down to an individual component that needs to be tracked. So we were going to take a, 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 a diversion here to address some of the questions. So we've got one that's how do you accept information in 1.0 could have a dramatic effect on your ability to monitor information required for 2.0. So that's more of a statement than a question. Yeah. Definitively. Yes. Well, I think it prioritizes, you know, what that you can't just run some things in parallel. To some extent, you have to be respectful that the fact that there's the interdependencies. Yeah, and I think it's an important point also to, to discuss coming back to the point of this meeting and our team organizations. You know, we're chunking the problem down. Let's not fall into silos that are then just focusing on a piece of it, making sure that the teams in, in our team overall is giving the picture of the forest and don't get stuck down at a tree level. Because, you know, that first pass of engineering to procurement, fabrication to scheduling, the fact is these are all interrelated. And again, there's going to be lines going between the two that I think that's what we're going to wean out is where are the information dependencies across these. And so there, there's a high level of interdependency. So just keep asking. Yeah, and so, so in terms of how do you plan for 2.0 while driving 1.0, you know, they need to be done in parallel. And I think, again, on our team, one of the, the risks we would face would say, well, hey, let's just go in and focus on the engineering side of it. I'm suggesting we do a breadth, then depth meaning let's have coverage in all of those areas. And depending upon resources available and who jumps in on the team to actually commit, it's doubtful we're going to be able to cover them all. In fact, we're probably going to add items that we would ultimately want to get more detail in, but we, we should prioritize and have coverage across all of the areas in parallel as we develop the information. And the reality is that really needs done to some extent on the projects as well. And we'll get into the, the process for implementation later where, where some of that hopefully becomes clearer through the development of our project. Hey, Ted, uh, one of the things I kind of went through is you were going through the, the 1.0 and the 2.0, I was just kind of defining whether it's a typical engineering uh, activity or is it a construction activity, trying to, especially in the 2.0 where you get, you get a pretty good mix uh, where who, who typically takes responsibility of these particular activities to kind of get a feel for where, where the, the, the work's being done. Yes. Uh, and in one, it was between engineering and fabrication, uh, identifying. So I just kind of made, made my notes and marked them up to yeah. kind of see which house they, they belong to. Well, that's right. And there's a slide we'll get to later in terms of what would define as the deliverables for each of our bite-sized chunks. And that's one of the key things that that analysis needs to say is who's the We're participants into this, you know, who are the responsible parties and uh, that should be analyzed on a point by point, you know, at a point by point level. And uh, we'll, we'll get to a deliverable slide that really points that out in you know, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. You know, getting, you know, beyond the, the CPM schedule and the cost alignment, and really, I, in my mind is saying there's, there's a, in addition to the engineering areas, there's probably a 3.5, 3.6. And, you know, we're looking for input on, you know, what do we see initially missing relative to advanced work packaging? One word of caution is, you know, we're not trying to solve the integration problems for the entire project or entire life cycle. You know, we want to keep this focused on the advanced work packaging model so that, you know, we don't get too far outside the bounds. But I'll say that, again, the advanced work packaging model took an approach of saying, here's the entire project delivery system. And they identified boxes that were traditional project activities. They identify and they classified boxes in, in this big detailed process model in three different categories, traditional project activities. On the other extreme, project activities that are completely new and part of the advanced work packaging model. Then an intermediate category that said project activities that are modified based upon, I mean, the, traditionally the projects have done this, but there needs to be some modifications to that activity 
based upon the advanced work packaging model. And I think you know, we, we need to do some level of classification ourselves of, hey, typically the project's doing this already, it's something they've already done, versus is this something completely new, versus is this something that, well, it's a modification to how projects did it before. And there may be things that are suggested up as bullet points where we go, well, that's a traditional project delivery thing, but it's completely outside of advanced work packaging. Right, because that's what they also did in their diagram is, well, here's a box as a reference box, but it's just complementary to advanced work packaging, not really affected by it. So diving into a specific example would really help provide perhaps some clarification on you know, how we're looking to break this down. So I'm going to go to one of my favorite ones, which you know, comes back to the materials area again, which is, you know, really being able to understand that constraint between an installation work package and what materials are available on site. And are, it, do you have enough work in front of you based upon materials to, to be productive? And this gives just a, a visualization of the type of results that would come out of that analysis where you'd be able to come into both a CWA, CWP level, and then ultimately zoom into a specific work package and know, do I have all the materials? Do I have part of the materials? And do I have none of the materials? And so if you look at, a, at a, you know, breaking that work process down, AIM 2.5 would be work packages drive the trial allocation process. It's not a one-way flow. You know, one of the challenges with the materials are certain material types, like a valve, eight-inch block valve, you may have, you know, 150 of those on a project. And where you decide to use them should be based upon your priorities of what you want to build. And so, you know, most material management systems support the and I say site material management systems support the process of defining the work packages, getting them loaded into the material management system, then having the material management system allocate the materials based upon your priorities of what you want to build first, second, third. And then the material management system will give back a shortage report of what's not available for those set of packages. And being able to utilize that information in the planning process is you know, represented in this simplified schematic block diagram and then what we're going to hone in on as one of those blue bullets here is this site material management system operation where one of the challenges that you know many material management managers on a project will have is they just you know, lack the granular definition of the work packages because in the system you may initially define cwp or schedule level areas but again that's a pretty broad macro level and if that's all you're doing great you get a certain benefit but there's significant benefit to then further refine the definition of those boundaries into the materials management system down to an installation work package level so you actually have an answer of well i don't have partial for the whole thing but i can come into this part and start doing the, the building process here and you're going to have information going into the material management system of what is the work package scope and sequence basically defining the priorities of what you want to build where and then the results of what's coming out is going to be a material feasibility analysis coming out of that material management system that can be used to then support the type of visualizations we looked at in, in the previous slide. And I'm not gonna go through the set of attributes and this would be for the project to actually do. This is just one example that I threw up that you know, we kinda gotta you know, maybe use as a starting point, but you know, kinda call it a fresh day. And in fact, I mean, there, there's two things here saying that there's really a definition of what your work packages are, then there's another definition of the schedule. So what's here shown here in the data is more the schedule of the IWPs that are being done in a production planning system. You could try to do that in a CPM-based scheduling system on a large mega project not the best thing to do because the reality is those definitions are changing at a fairly frequent rate based upon your constraints and if you try to manage all of that in a scheduling cpm scheduling system it's it becomes can become logistically a nightmare for the project so you're better off doing a production planning approach but regardless of where the data is again you need to drive the definition of the scope of the package and the sequencing of the package and then the result would come out saying well what's available you know what materials do you have what's been issued, what's been reserved, what's been forecasted. This is the type of information that you can get out. This is, again, one example. It's actually often better if you get it down to where, you know, the, the material management system passes you back. Also, you may have a double here of, a, I mentioned before, a shortage report. Something would say, for this package, here's explicitly the materials that are missing. It can be another data set. But we want to get down to that level of the specific information examples. And I want to emphasize something else. This is a, a particularly problematic one because many times 
these data flows need to go across enterprise boundaries. It's very often the case that at the IWP level, you have a constructor that is potentially a separate company than the EPC prime contractor on a project that may have the materials management system. And so where you get the materials management system and then another team building packages, but all they have access to is a Citrix screen of the materials, and they have no way to automate the loading of packages into it, no way to receive automated dumps out of it, you'll see the advanced work packaging in the field slowly lose a major aspect of its benefit because the information exchange had to flow across enterprise boundaries. So as we identify these, that's one of the things we also want to emphasize is particularly where and again, it's going to be a project specific implementation part, but at least we can give a generalized analysis to say where does information need to flow from one company to another? Meaning, you know, coming back to the, the previous view, the team actually building the IWPs may be different than the team that has their hands on the, the administrative and, and you know, uh, uh, pushing the buttons and doing the actual management of the site materials. Maybe it is the same contractor. Now, it again, depends upon the specific project. Hey, Ted. We get a question about um, change management. Is the where where would it fall in on, on the current slide that you see? You currently have a where, where do you see change management falling in? I think that's a really it's fundamentally pervades across all of them, and we actually have identified a major um, area which not only deals with change management but also with the alignment of the component level build materials across these systems which suddenly comes across, and obviously a big part of the change management is being driven from the engineering information coming in, but as a work process, it's one that, that we need to categorize and you know, look at from a, a project. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a highly valid question and perhaps one of our biggest challenges to say, well, how are we going to address that? Because again, it pervades, it's, as opposed to the other 1.1, 1.2s, it kind of you know, becomes one that suddenly is pervading across them. Yeah, because it can make you go back and undo stuff that you've already done. Yeah. And, and you, you know, so now your packages that were complete are now incomplete. Yeah. And you got to go back. Well, I, I would state this as well. I mean, you know, one of the things that came out of the COA CII model, and, and this I'm speaking from major practical experience on this, um, you need to keep your packages virtual all the way to the end. And that's one of the things that the, the, the CII models really pointed out is that if you go in and, and you know, get whatever tool you want to use and then start building packages and chunking them on the shelves and say, hey, great, I'm doing work-based planning. Here's all my packages. Oh, danger, danger. You know, it's uh, the Will Rogers danger. You know, <laughs> forget the, the, the old TV show there, reference to the joke. But, you know, um, you need, because, again, the fluidity at the IWP doesn't mean at the CWP level. At the CWP level, you should be defining relatively fixed. You still have these change management issue, but you're dealing with a level where even though the scope within them, at the IWP level, you may be throwing IWPs out and defining entire new IWPs. You may just be changing IWP boundaries. So if your project's going into a mode of building installation work packages, printing them out, putting them on the shelf, as you said, saying they're complete in the planning phase, it tends to make that change management problem unmanageable, meaning suddenly the changes are going to happen, not just because of engineering revisions, but because of constraints. You start having deals with the packages. You need to keep those IWPs virtual until you know you can do them. The field's committed to do them. So taking them through the last planner concepts of one is you're not just doing work because, hey, that's something I want to do. It should be following your overall sequence and schedule. So is it a should? Is it a can, meaning can I actually do this work, which is the constraint question, you know, and then am I committed to doing it? You know, do you have the crew saying, yes, I'm going to do it? Because the other major thing that, that also COA CII point out is if you end up having packaging that doesn't directly reflect what's being done in the field, again, you kind of lose it. Even if they're constraint free, your field may be off doing something else. You need to have a commitment with the crews and have the crews involved in that planning. But coming back to the change management, you know, we need to drive the system and the vendors to to further be able to propagate new information into the package and then have a last chance editing of the package before you say this one is executable. Now let me commit it to being an officially released work package. So your, you know, your, your, your revving of the packages, you should be keeping them in a virtual state until you know that you can do them. So you're trying to minimize building a package, putting all the documentation into it to find out that, well, I didn't have materials or I didn't have a drawing. Now I can only do a piece of a package. So coming back to this list, 
you know, I, I just want to, I don't want to overly rush and I do want to leave it up for a minute. You know, I kind of hit the, the CPM schedule and cost alignment and we've got a good question again we want to want to come back to. I'm just going to, you know, flip and then come back if you don't mind. A major effort for us, and I mentioned this before, is for us to review, add, and prioritize. So we've got, we, we've, we've divided this meeting up into two major sessions. One, which is let's present the information. Then another one is let's switch to the telephone part of the meeting and jump in and really get the input where we're hoping a large portion of our of our audience there can stay on and add, not just through you have to type in a question, but you know, on the phone, add in, hey, have you thought about this and have you thought about that? So we're gonna have we're gonna come back to this as a major focal point of our interactive discussions. Okay, so let's go over to the question. Reg, do you want to read the question? Yeah, there's a question that asked if you should include cost report as a cost reporting breakdown. Is it part of the WBS um, construction work packaging or how does that fit in? In our definition over here, I've got it as a 3.2. It's definitively an item that should also be similar to a WBS. We should have the work packages. And in, in, in a sense, in my mind, you know, the, the cost coding is a parallel organization to the IWP. Now, this is going to become, I think, as the industry matures, a high, an issue of, of high, de high degree of debate and hopefully further productivity improvement. What I mean by that is some of the companies that have been adopting work-based planning down at an IWP level are starting to realize, hey, why don't we make an IWP an actual cost code and then measure and track productivity by that IWP? Right now, that's generally not done in the industry. Generally, cost codes are independently maintained, but independent of whether they line up with the CWP. Let's assume when most projects are not going to line up with the CWP, not line up with the IWP boundary. It comes back to that point I made earlier of component level alignment, meaning we should be able to tap every component onto a cost code or more than one cost code, right? Because a component's going to go through multiple activities. So a component, you take a pipe spool or a valve or a steel beam or a, a, a cable that needs to be pulled. There's going to be a set of cost codes that are going to be attached and associated with those components. And that how you get that done is the intent of 3.2, meaning it's not just saying get the cost code definition. The 5D aspect says we should be able to align each of these components at our BIM level down to a set of cost codes that need to be tracked. Now, at that that's where then that component at a cost code level relates to some work package. And it may not even be an installation work package, right? Because then it suddenly matrixes into it may be part of a test package, may be part of an installation work package, may be part of a module work package, which is a subset within a module. I mean, and the whole module area is another one that still has some lack of definition. You know, for many of the modules I'm seeing built to say one whole module is a work package is a bit of a joke. You know, some of the ones I've seen done up in Canada, yeah, you could say this little pipe rack, maybe you call that a work package. But in all honesty, you know, if you're following the, the COA model, you should be breaking work pack IW that that at that IWP level, which may go into even a module shop, should be broken down into what equates to a shift or a set of work that's being done through maybe a 10-day shift or a or a one-week period, approximately. And one of the one of the principles, by the way, if you're if you're not onto it, is you shouldn't be breaking the work packages down by hours. There's a recommended guideline that says, well, hey, make it something that's doable, but they should have good start-stop finishes. But it shouldn't be a start stop finish that suddenly pervades two to three months of the project or a month of the project. It should be a bite sized chunk, but use common sense and constructability to get the scope of the package to be something that it makes sense to do all of that as one chunk of work. Maybe it takes a week and a half, maybe it takes two. But you know, coming down to back to the question is if you think about it at a data level, information level, the cost codes are defined somewhere, where to pull that from is again something that you know 3.2 should define, but then 3.2 may end up becoming a 3.234. That's where we may see a couple of them in there. I know that for both the 4D and the 5D, those are pretty significant categories compared to some of the others, but at least on the first pass of putting it up there, you know, at the coming down to the data level again, you know, as you get, there's a matching process to say, take the, com the, the components that are being driven out of engineering, whether they're in a 3D model or coming from the fabricator data, et cetera, and get cost codes assigned onto them, not just one, but cost codes based upon the specific activities. Whenever you're building those IWPs, you're essentially you know, picking some material and you're not putting the material in the package per se, you're really putting the task 
level five or level six task associated with that material, that component into the package, which should be associated with some cost code. And so, you know, if you look at an IWP, you got a set of cost codes that as you progress that work, it should be coming back and then, you know, going directly into updating what work's being done in a cost code area. So a bit of a long answer, but I didn't want to trivialize the, the question either. I think it's, it's a really key one. And I think that that schedule and cost alignment areas, you know, if you went to like, again, our priorities of breadth and depth, those are kind of the you know, two of the big ones to say, well, if you don't get those type of alignments, you're not, you're not getting the, the benefit on the productivity analysis that could come out of the work packaging. doesn't mean advanced work packaging you're not going to get any benefits of, but I've seen that many times you'll see, well, the packages are going there, but you're having a hard time monitoring package progress back to updating of cost codes. And quite frankly, you know, coming back to my point on measuring productivity on a package level, our industry suffers from true productivity analysis, which is why getting quantitative measurables on the benefits of something, you know, our, our productivity analysis tend to be macro level and it's tough to get down to true productivity. At, the, at a recent COA best practices conference, we saw a presentation from a team from Shell where they had the productivity analysis down to, in fact, they defined a, what do they call it, a, um, a, a CBS, a cost breakdown structure, where they had, now these were for high, highly repeatable work as part of the, the Albion Sands tailings part of the project, not the whole Albion Sands, but the tailings where it's kind of the, the pipeline. They ended up getting work packages at a level six put into a primavera schedule where they were highly repeatable and executable so that they weren't so much shuffling of them, meaning you know, the work isn't so constrained as maybe you know, a major ISBL area where, where things are changing so much. So in that case, they did use primavera to manage all their packages and they were measuring productivity down at the level of individual wells. Fantastic. I mean, that's where we want to see, I think, this ultimately come. And perhaps we you know, build upon some of that practical experience of what the guys did up there on that project, the team did on that project, and introduce you know, the CBS. But certainly people are going to have their inputs, and that's where we, we look for some of the stakeholders who have expertise in the cost breakdown structure area to get involved. I think you're totally right that uh, with cost, uh, there just isn't the correlation between the current cost models and workplace plan uh, or uh, IWPs. Yeah. And the trouble is that when you benchmark, you try and benchmark one, it doesn't correlate to the other one. So you can't actually show the, the cost benefit. It gets lost because no one can actually, it's not apples and, well, it's apples and oranges, not apples and apples. And Precisely. It just, it just a, then you get into, well, what really maybe helped the productivity? It's blurred across many yeah. different things. And to be able to get into then understanding even what areas of your project are having trouble. You know, I think that's where if we had a better blending and alignment between the work packaging and the cost coding structures, it would provide more immediate feedback on where the work packaging is working well, where it's not. So it's not just, did it overall help the project, but where can the project provide more attention? And that was part of what Shell actually presented. They won an industry award for their effort on that project. Yeah, so I was really excited about it. And that's one of the major points that they said was it suddenly turned the light on, right? It was like, it's a little tough to do because sometimes that whole contractual relationship between the owner and the contractors to get all the visibility of what's being done on the table but it ultimately benefits everybody. And you know, once the light was on in terms of where the trouble areas are, you know, it's easier to, to go in and focus in on, on that work. Reg, do we have another question we wanna discuss? Yeah, uh, one individual that's on the webinar pointed out that, the, that they see a call out for scaffolding, but not for construction equipment. Fantastic feedback, let's add it in. <laughs> that's exactly what we wanted to get. So now we've got a 4.9. You know, equipment uh, you know, management, and I think that's key. Okay, and then there was uh, another question here that the question is: is that I see in BSA is involved? Are you using building information modeling in this AIM effort? And are you talking with Deke Smith and about BSA? No, that, that the intent would be to do that absolutely. Uh, I, to say that that no, the, the direct question we haven't yet um, engaged in a, in a heavy level discussion with Deke Smith, and you know for those that are joining the project and have the institutional commercial side of uh, industry domain expertise, we, we're hoping you, we can get you involved and you know engage those discussions. You know the, they've developed a a fairly detailed specification, and in fact one of the things I'd say hopefully we can do not necessarily phase one, but is is certainly a phase two aspect of our project is. They've, they've got some data sets available 
on that side of the camp. Meaning, you know, if I'm understanding of BSA and, and please add in there is, you know, is what I heard. One of the things I learned at the most recent Thea Tech, Tech Showcase was there's now a published data model. Todd, yeah, maybe you I want to comment all, on that. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I have them all on my computer right now. So I have them on the external hard drive. So, I can so certainly from the engineering so, side, yeah. we have a data set to start with in terms of something that could be used to demonstrate, you know, data integration and how to do the packages. Yeah, the IFC models and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So there was, there was a follow-up a comment that was made with respect to effort that's going on that could be associated with 3.0. Uh, there's activity that's life cycle phases and sub-phases, and it seems to be an opportunity for us to coordinate with AIM, uh, and this is uh, BSA, BSA standards 3.0. Yeah. So we obviously have to link into that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the, the key areas that I've also tucked in, and, and it was a, a bit of a debate in my mind, you know, under 4.0, there's a whole area of how do these packages integrate with document management. And I think it's an open issue that's not that hard for us to solve, but let's try to nail it down. And part of the, uh, personally, I think, you know, part of the challenge we face there is proprietary aspects of systems, meaning does it end up becoming that? Each vendor supports their own package management system. But meanwhile, you see that many contractors and owners have a system like a documentum or something that ultimately those packages should be going into. And so there's kind of a work in process management of the package while you're still under that high rev, hey, things are changing, you know, engineering's changing, the nature, you know, the boundaries of the packages are changing. But once you say, hey, this is the package I want to do it, which is why I put it under the 4.0. Meaning once that, once that package is saying, hey, this is a package I'm committing to it, we should be defining an interface that says, how does that package now become an official Rev 1 of a you know, version that goes under document control? And that is an area where from a, not a technical aspect, but a work process model, COA and CII have nailed it. There is really good definition that they, the COA CII model has one level that that is detailed work process diagrams according to stage one, stage two, stage three, that looks at advanced work packaging in the framework of the entire project. And again, it gets down to very detailed work process blocks. They've got another complementary set of diagrams that is focused on the life cycle of a work package. And I'm not sure, you know, it'd be coming back to the question, you know, the life cycle model being developed by BSA may not align up with doing that analysis of, you know, where does that fall into and in relative to the COA documentation? And then again, given that our focus is on advanced work packaging, us not trying to solve the whole industry's data integration problems, you know, I think we would be very much in our interest to take that life cycle of a work package and see how that applies to that BSA model. And and even though, you know, in some sense, you know, uh, 10 years ago, whenever you know it was like exploring was work packaging, it's very much in a kind of a practice that was being adopted in an industrial plant. Went over to some building contractors. They're like, ah, we don't do that. Well, what's interesting is, you know, some of the recent events I've attended, you know, you've got companies that, in fact, are doing it. They're just not calling it work packaging. You know, and so, you know, we've got to be sensitive to the terminology, et cetera. Um, but, you know, having an effort to say, you know, take what's already been done because there's been some significant advancements relative to BSA and seeing how that lines up with the definition of packages. And is it just a terminology and then taking the life cycle of a package and applying that life cycle of a package management into here. And then coming back to my point, you know, the life cycle package really gets into that constraint analysis, keeping the package virtual, you know, defining it early constraining it, then once it's ready for field execution, now making it an official document that gets delivered into the project that's a control document that should be managed and interface in the document control. Additionally to that, you know, it's, it's kind of a, you know, similar to the point of, well, hey, what about equipment? You'll suddenly see that, you know, for the different work package types, there's different types of documents that need to go in there. And many times that's just a template document that somebody's filling out information from. It may not be fed by data from some other automated system. And so for us to be able to do that analysis and say, hey, this is the type of document that once you make a package, it becomes a form that somebody's filling in and identifying that as part of what we're in. And then we don't want to discount the, the testing turnover and completion side of it as well. So I'm going to go, go on, Reg. Yeah, so it, the, the takeaway on this is that I just got some emails from the Building Smart Alliance folks, and we need to hold hands with them very quickly. Fantastic. And so. Uh, and then obviously there's synergies there too, so we're very 
opportunistic in the sense as long as we're advancing the industry as a whole, everything's good. Good. Okay, so we're going to come back to this again later in our discussion. So let's keep on going so we can do it. But this is where, you know, and this is where I should have had to change management on there. So somebody's called me out. Yeah, I should have been here. But I think that there's core information mapping requirements that span across. Them. And the one I highlighted here, which is definitively related to the change management, and, and trust me, I've had more detailed slides I could have put in here, is consistency and global alignment and naming conventions. And I want to make a little point on my own, and we'll see where it ends up at the end of this not just the team meeting, but this overall project. Many times I go into sessions and there's this idea, well, we just need a master registry of all the components somewhere. I actually think that's a farce. I think that's a, a, a something that then, you know, if you get down to it, you can have multiple parallel definitions of components and it physically reality makes sense. Engineering may make something and they designed a, a, a beam or a, let's say a, a, a wall panel, something, and it was designed as red. Somehow it ended up being fabricated, it became blue. But the field decided it was going to become purple. Now, you know, do you end up just saying, well, it's got a red, blue, and purple attribute and multiplex it? The reality is each of those groups may have had parallel activities going on where in their perspective, there was some reason why they did that. And point being, you know, to, to think that we're going to solve this by having one master database where all the components live and all the systems just work off of that is not only from an information technology perspective unmanageable, it is also doesn't go to the needs of the physical reality of projects where you've got situations where you need to have parallel representations of that information. Okay, so I don't think we solve this by just saying, hey, there's some single database where all the components are. On a more practical level, I think we can solve it by coming up with a work process that institutes consistency in what you call components across the different applications being used on a project, as well as not just the lowest B level BOM, but also the aggregation of definitions of turnovers and areas and CWPs and EWPs to make sure that the various applications that are being used are using a consistent terminology, which then if change occurs at one point and was introduced through engineering or change was introduced through fabrication or change was introduced through the field, that change can be easily propagated into the other systems. That's one of the things we definitively struggle with is that, you know, the, there's not an upfront effort to get consistency in alignment of the conventions where slight misnaming conventions can suddenly make it difficult to get alignment between these systems. You know, and then again, to another further practical aspect is you may have you know, detailing going on where, again, coming down to the granularity, there's an initial definition of, of something in an engineering phase. It gets further broken down in the fabrication phase. So there's a hierarchy of the naming conventions that are very much at play and significantly correlate and relate to the change management. Yeah, well, the project SCID is a perfect example of that. Yeah. Skid, SCID's got, got a name. And then there's all the components that make up the skid, and it, it just keeps getting bound, That's, bound, bound. Yeah. Whereas the skid in a engineered EPC model may just have a skid representation and not representing all of the, the lower level components. In fact, some of that lower level, what's on the skid may not be delivered until the turnover phase. And many times there's practical reasons why an equipment manufacturer isn't, doesn't, and they shouldn't be required to devel, divulge all their information in terms of that level of detail to every participant on the project, because right? that's a proprietary piece of equipment that, you know, you don't want to have, so here it is, everybody's got access to all that model information. I mean, there's, you know, real significant, again, physical and, and practical contractual limitations to how the information is shared and why it's not going to all be in one big master database. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're going to get into now saying that's how we want to approach the, prog the problem. As you have my chunking it down into these subsections, and what would we see as our set of deliverables? So going from the top, what we've talked about at a detailed example level so far really applies to the, what we're calling, and apologize for if the term's a little confusing. We struggled as we put the slides together for what do we call it. We're calling it a library of information mapping requirements and sources. Meaning, we chunk the problem down into larger sections and then into smaller sections where the library is made up of those sections. And in fact, I think that that evolves over the course of time. 
right? You know, our, our aim phase one and phase two may not hit them all. And in fact, as, as we get into it, but it should be something that would allow additional content to be added to it in the future. But, you know, we want to come out with the descriptions of those individual target mappings, those little blue balls, and have those documents be delivered as part of our aim deliverables. But it's only an example in a reference model. And so equally important is a deliverable on our project is how would you use it? And how would you then go from, I've got a project, I need to make use of this stuff. So we actually develop in parallel with those, that library, we develop a specific project implementation guide that goes from the, how should you say, the, the reference model into specifically how would you implement this on a project? And that would be represented by this. And we're going to detail each one of these out a little more in the following slides. In addition to that, we want to really use it, right? So we don't want to just be left with we're producing something and it's not being effectively utilized. So we've made it part of our project deliverable to get involved in the evaluation. Oh, excuse me. That's the proof of concept. Number three goes to there's already efforts out there. BSA being a good one. You know, the ISO 15926 being another one. We want to make our project not something running independent of those. We're not intent to replace those activities. We're going to reference them. Hopefully, in a lot of our cases that we go through, and we say, here's a, here's a blue ball. Here's the function and purpose of this activity. Here's the information in. Here's the information out. Oh, great. There's three standards based upon what sector of the industry you're in that are related to that. Maybe there's one standard that suffices across all sectors of the industry. Let's reference it. Give it a thumbs up. Great. There may be areas where we go, hey, there's really nothing that's touched this yet. And again, it's not going to stop us from defining it. Maybe it means that a standard ultimately gets put in place. It may be something that, well, hey, you know, we've done enough of a job where we've come up with a reference model that at least for a project, I mean, we don't want lack of a standard to stop us from defining it so it could be used on a project. And I don't think it has to. And we're not wanting to become a standards effort, but I believe our Analysis will hopefully drive more information into the standards efforts so that, you know, we could give them feedback. And that's part of that deliverable is not just to say, well, hey, where do the standards relate to this advanced work packaging model? But even more so begin to develop well, where are where, where they don't cover and provide that as we've identified information requirements where maybe they could cover them in the future. And then the fourth one goes to let's get engaged with some member companies and actually putting this to use providing feedback on it, then having it become a you know, continuous improvement process. And then finally, a, a report that would go with that. So this is another one that, that you know, we need to beat up, although I believe to some extent it's going to be done in the team breakouts beyond this meeting. Although if people have comments, I think we should reserve a little bit of time to get some comments on this as well. Particularly again, you know, one of the slides we bring back up during the interactive discussion mode. This was our effort to say, okay, as we chunk the problem down, the equivalent of an installation work package, what's our outline for each one of the, the you know, functional scope areas that we want to identify? And we come in and we do a little workflow diagram like, like the example I showed, where, where it shouldn't be overly complicated. I mean, if it's got tons of activities, that's where it would really say, hey, break this down further. If it's something that has uh, one or two activities that we can focus on, inputs and outputs on, great. And we should have a written description so that it's not just somebody in a, in a slide like we did today kind of verbalizing it. It's something that would capture that description of it so it's officially documented and described with some supporting figures and tables. And I think this is also where, you know, in parallel with our work breakdown structure of deliverable three standards activities, we may be able to go out and pull information from other specific efforts. You know, like that, the one I pulled out was an early version of something Co and CII was working on. So it wasn't even, I mean, that was the life cycle of the work package document where I said, well, hey, here's a great example where some applications that need to support this, right? You know, they're, they're talking about in terms of functional use, independent of applications. We suddenly said, well, hold on, there's material management application, et cetera. You know, and so I think as we look into the BSA documentation, look into the industry documents and standards efforts, we may be able to pull from material there already where they've already solved some of that which is great, which may accelerate you know, down the rest of the list. But you know, it may not be, it shouldn't stop us from at least pulling it down and doing the due diligence to go through and produce these subset deliverables under, this is a per mapping, if that makes sense. I want to make sure that's clear. So we're not doing this for the whole project. We're taking each one of those 
individual functional use cases and then breaking them down into this is you know the information we produce for one of them. <clears throat> the required functionality in representative applications in what we're calling resources, where in our sense resources is either a source of information or something that needs to receive information, but also be part of the analysis we do there. You know, what are the applications that are involved? Uh, who are the people that are actually using those applications? All right, so that's where we want to identify what the roles are and say, well, you know, who's actually doing it. And I put there as a fourth bullet, us emphasizing, hey, this is often, it may not be 100% the case, but this is an often cross-enterprise information exchange. And let's highlight those. because so I think to some extent, that helps drive some of our prioritization because experience in the past has been when the workflows are more self-contained within a single contractor on the project, they often succeed much better. But when they suddenly involve information being exchanged across them, also interdivisional. So it may not just be enterprise, but it's also good to point out that it may be a divisional boundary that needs cross within a company. So we can do a analysis to say, hey, this information needs to come from a different division within the same company or even across companies. The list of inputs, outputs. So this is the information in, this is the information coming out. The next two, in a sense, correlate to this information outputs. It's more of a categorization where we say, some of that information may be directly going into the package itself, right? And as we were in, in the FIA tech, tech showcase, that was something we kept, you know, was kind of going down. I was making the point that a lot of these information exchanges don't necessarily go into the package. They support the planning and execution of the packages themselves. And so let's I classify them as, hey, is this an information flow where that is something that goes into the package, where the package is a document set that's going to be published and put into document control? Or is this a supporting information exchange that's being used to do a constraint analysis on a package, but isn't necessarily something that goes into the package itself? Like a piece of equipment that's required? Wow. That's real loud. Yeah. There was a question, a comment that when we have a conversation in here, that you need to restate the question, or else whoever it is speak really, really loud. Finish the, finish it through the conversation with everybody. Yeah, on the phone. Yeah, yeah and, and again, we can discuss this at the end when we have the open forum and we turn the phone on as well. And I mentioned before, you know, since so we developed the workflow diagram that references to applicable industry data standards, that, you know, that's really should be done at the same time. So this isn't a sequential set of activities per se, but it's relative to that. I mean, again, if we can borrow workflow diagrams and we don't have to repeat them, that's actually the preference. Right? If we can go, hey, here's a functional case and there's something that's already covering this, fantastic. Um, in addition to the information that's required, another key piece of, of practicality that needs done on a project is, well, how often does that information need to be supplied? Is this something where the applications need to talk live? Most situations, it's not. Most of the the, the the, the examples we're going to go through, it's really working off of some published information, right? Because somebody's using an application, they're producing something. And so, but what's the frequency and timing of that? How often would be our recommended delivery of that? And are there specific things relative to you know, accuracy in addition to timing that should be noted? If we get to the last three, or at least that, that third to last one, I think we're, we're, we're cooking with grease for sure. I mean, can we get to the point where we actually have representative sample data sets? You know, that's often the challenge is, you know, it's proprietary. And furthermore, I put the word dynamic there. You think of it as a static data set, takes a very BIM engineering centric aspect of it. The problem on construction is stuff is moving. And unless you've got data and it hits the whole change management area, Unless you've got data that actually shows the change at a certain state in the project, it's not like construction works off of 100% engineering and engineering never changes and then the plans never change, et cetera. These are dynamic moving data sets. And so one of the challenges of doing this in a simulation is it would cost a lot of money and time to try to simulate a real project. So I think the reality is that you know until you latch onto a project where all that data is really moving, you can't really demonstrate that you know you've got this right, and that's you know, certainly I think one of the the conundrums we face in advanced work packaging overall. You know, now maybe as we simplify it down and we determine the well, way we break this use case down, it gets us into you know a simple example. But you know, going through that one that I showed, just the materials management one, it took a large effort to try to simulate that independent of a project. I've been through it, 
So just for that one to say, hey, we're going to come in and show multiple materials movement and receiving and then suddenly you latch onto a project and there's all the data, if you follow me. Meaning uh, now the challenge, it's like the chicken before the egg kind of thing, right? Because until you have the definition, to then get the information and the format you want and the consistency you want. So that should not stop us from doing the definitions. But how far we get along the representative sample data sets, I think we're going to not only be bounded by member participation, but we're going to be bounded by the fact that it's not easy to fake a lot of the construction side of the data. It's, it's not, I'm not going to say that it's trivial or easier. I'm just saying that having the experience of it, it is more simpler to come up with a representative BIM or an engineering model that you know, has the components because you're publishing something as opposed to being published consuming in, a, in such a high dynamic environment. So some of the functional cases, it's, it may not be trivial to, to get to that deliverable. And so some of this is significantly gonna feed into the other deliverables, like the analysis of what standards are there, the recommendation for what additional things need to be done. So this, this first major deliverable area, the, the, the mappings, really becomes you know, our, our point of our information production that's gonna feed into the final report, feed into our write-up of what standards exist or not, help drive you know, what can be done in a demonstration because it's gonna be defined by how much we produce here. So again, I, I don't suggest that this outline's 100% perfect, but you know, Bill O'Brien had suggested, you know, is one of the first activities we go through one, produce it, make it a template, get an idea for how much effort it takes to produce this, and then we'll have a better sense for you know, how much of a problem are we tackling off as well as do we have the outline and the content correct. So I think that's a really good approach. Okay, so in terms of the, the project implementation guide, I, I it's initially define it as four major steps that on a project, given that we'd have a library of information mapping, documentation requirements put together, the first step would be saying, you know, the project does a needs assessment based upon this particular project. You know, where does information need to go? You could reference the library and really decide there may be things in the library that's completely missing and doesn't cover it for advanced work packaging, in which case, great. There may be, okay, great, pull this one out. So it's basically the process of identifying the specific project needs, you know, what can be used and, and where things exist. And then the next step, the mapping would be, well, now you actually take that as a reference mapping and realize it into the requirements for that project. Right, because it's going to also depend upon the exact nature of the systems and the contractual relationships. So we're not, we're not, our library is not something that it's, it's a reference example to be implemented on a project. It not intended to work is the exact, you know, dogmatic approach on each project. Having an ability to have our material be utilized on a project without dictating this is exactly how you have to do it, we think is a key aspect of this. But we should have a process on a project by which that analysis is done and the mappings are actually then crystallized to the fourth point which is it could be put into deliverables on the project so a major theme of our overall aim project approach is the contracting world works off of deliverables too often data is not described as a deliverable we're hoping to change that and it's not just data that has to be handed over at the end of the project in fact there's other fiat tech projects that are focusing more on that part our part is more information exchanges that need to occur in the project to support the advanced work packaging approach. And can we get those into where our library allows rapid pulling out of sections saying, well, hey, this contractor or this participant should be producing here. Here's a timing and frequency. And it's something to make the project really streamlined across project participants. Those can be included as data deliverables as part of a project. How far that uplift occurs, it's going to be interesting to see. But we're certainly going to define them with the intent that they could be used. And we want to define a process by which they could be put into contractual aspects of a contract. I wouldn't state that if it's not in a contractual aspect, it's not relevant or not beneficial. I think it, you know, this information producing requirements is still beneficial. Dan, I don't know if you'd have a strong opinion on that or not. Uh, no, I say it's you're, you're right on. Uh, you know. It, up in the top where you say guidelines, that's key. Yeah. Because so it's not like it's dictating a project. You must do this particular way. Yeah. It's, it's a guideline saying, you know, look at your job conditions and then apply these where they, 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 they meet the conditions of the project. Exactly. And then 
Finally, you know, to think that we're that the process is just going to define it up front and then data starts flowing, we need to, to put a process in place and describe the process in which there's monitoring and oversight of it. Auditing. Yeah, I mean, if there's not a follow-up to see that is the information being produced, is it being consumed? Because it may be going into the ether and nothing's being done with it, right? So, I mean, this isn't we're, we're not doing this because we just like data. We're doing it because we want to make construction more productive and predictable. So, is it effectively at the information level occurring? Now, emphasize a point, COA CII and potentially even what we find from you know, the BSA information, there is a larger auditing of is advanced work packaging. And that's one of the major COA CII deliverables that you know, I, I'd say everybody dive into and get, get a sense of is they've put together an auditing checklist on are you following the advanced work packaging process? And we shouldn't be repeating that again. We should be referring to it. But they don't get down into the information flows. So we should be doing that auditing it. You know, and describe it again as a process. And once you've identified the information flows, once you've mapped them specifically for your project, then you've put them into specific deliverable requests where some company or division within a company has responsibility to deliver it. Let's put in place a system that can check for it. Now, hopefully that ultimately comes part of the great software vendors functionality themselves that ultimately, you know, it's checking for that. Or quite frankly, from what I understand around iRing and ISO 15926, iRing is independent of ISO 15926, and it could be used as a data validation and quality checking tool from what I understand. Now, it may be an area that we get a little bit more educated on. We may find a great synergy in the FIA Tech consortium here that's saying, well, hey, you know, if we've got a reference model that can then be quickly tweaked on a project, can you have somewhere that just checks that that information is meeting the content in, in delivery format specifications where iRing, which is one of the the joint efforts with Fiatech is not specific to ISO 15926, but could be applied in, into it. And again, given that we we're going to have many of our formats of information, we're going to say, well, this isn't exactly ISO 15926, but I bet you iRing would be you know, a potential great tool ultimately to use. I'm not suggesting our project will figure out the iRing part. So defining that process is you know, probably the, the chunk of the work there, along with the roles and responsibilities, the checklists, KPIs, and then gating requirements. So, you know, I think the, those bullet two through five are, in a sense, sub bullets of that overall process probably should have had them, you know, sub bulleted. Um, <clears throat> and then rolling that up into an actual project implementation guide yeah. is one of the major deliverables. So in my mind, I'm right now seeing, you know, this project's producing two major products, the library, along with this implementation guide. Our other deliverables, the final report, et cetera, you know, are all valuable as well, but I, I believe that those at least would define, and we're looking to get some good feedback on that work breakdown structure. Oops. Talked a lot, a lot around this, so you know, I don't think I need to cover it much. It just further breaks down this whole idea of roll up of you know pulling what the information has been produced out of the individual mappings and aggregating it, correlating it across the different lower level functional mappings into a consolidated document and then communicating and engaging with BSA and the ISO 15926 and other industry standard working groups, what we do. The proof of concept validation, which we really you know, broke down into two major sections, one being validating the library itself. Meaning as we go from, hey, this is what we think the information needs to be mapped, that needs to be realized is do those mappings make sense? Of course, we're saying those mappings aren't dogmatic, they're reference examples, but if our reference examples are way off base, then we should find out by actually trying to put them to use and validating the process, the project implementation guide itself. So we see a, a, a verification and validation around both aspects of that on a project. We should also develop a plan on how we're going to engage with the member projects themselves, get them educated, provide support and engagement with the projects on use of the tools, and then get the feedback. Right, so that as we coordinate with the member deployments, have them help drive our effort in terms of what we, what's working, what's not, and what we can do better and, and follow on efforts. I'm not going to walk through every section of this report. I'm going to get into some of the interactive conversations from a timing perspective. So do we want to wake up the phone now? I think so. Yeah, let me just give me one more minute because this is, this is an important part. Is this, doesn't, this is just a visual representation of what we had on the board or what we went through in terms of the deliverable. So it's just nice, a nice visual representation. And this is what we're proposing is phase one. So for phase one, it may be biting off a lot, but 
the point you know, I want to make is that you know, we're going to cover some set of those functional requirements. So the expectation is we're not going to hit 100% of them, but we're going to prioritize which ones we have and focus on the, the project implementation guide. So kind of push forward in those two areas. And as we're going through those, we're obviously identifying the standard efforts and pushing them out, but we're not yet going into writing a report. We're not yet going into trying it out on a project. Initially, I said we're not yet writing the final report, but as Reg and I went back through it, sections two through seven don't really depend upon, it's section seven and beyond that really depend upon what we do. Sections two through seven are more background. And we already have a lot of background information, so viably, if we can get a resource onto that, Reg, we could start cranking out the report. Well, and also the final report is going to encapsulate the project plan, which will be derived from this presentation today. So it, it is more or less a living document that will be aggregating information as it emerges. Okay. Then we've, we've proposed a set of team meetings. And, and what we're really looking for is in our discussion, not just to get feedback, to actually get people to commit. Because at the end of the day, this is uh, the challenge we all face is that this is a volunteer organization. And, you know, but this benefits our individual organizations. But if we don't get people, we've already got... Martin, Terry, Jarrett, myself, Reg, and, and Dr. O'Brien. And at the member meeting that we had, there was a lot of people that said, yeah, we wanted to do. We didn't have a good plan. We feel we now have a good basis of a plan. We want to break it down into these areas. Maybe there's a column missing. We can discuss that. But instead of making it one big project team, let's divide it into at our quote unquote CWP level, deliverable level, and make smaller teams where we can have people get more engaged. So if you're an expert in engineering and you know, data deliverables coming from engineers or fabricators, jump in on that side. Let's get down to saying what attributes need to be in the models and how is information passed off. If you're more on the materials management, that's great for you to participate, et cetera. If you're into the 4D, 5D area of how we correlate costs and schedule with the models, jump in. If you're heavy into you know, getting the packages constrained, analyzed, and you know, officially documented into document control, as well as have areas of equipment management or scaffolding that are particular interest for you. You don't have to sign up for just one. You know, I mean, you could be interested in a few of them. I don't think that's a problem. You know, as a management team, we need to bring them together and make sure that there's consistency across them and do make sure that the groups are participating and they don't become silos in of themselves. If you just want to be a reviewer, meaning you don't really you know, feel that you can contribute too much, but as we generate information, you're somebody who you'd like to receive it and then provide. But if you're going to sign up as a reviewer, we're hoping you really provide critical comments and you know, give constructive input to what's being produced. And if you're not sure yet, you know, let us know as well. So, Reg, we want to break into the conversation? Yes. Um, Todd, can you bring the, the slide up with the phone number on it? Sure. It's like